When we see you can take your seat, that we are on the brink of a third great awakening where God is going to shake his church, shake the nation, and shake his people. But friend, this revival is at the other side of your comfort zone. This revival comes when you cross the line from going through the motions and playing church to being all in, radical, on fire, sold out, Jesus freak, help me out here, Jesus freak, over the line, 100%, not a part-time believer, there is no room for lukewarm believers in this revival. There is no room for Pharisees, for malnutrition preachers, for anemic churches. The only people that are going to be a part of this revival are those who say we'd walk a hundred miles if we had to, to experience the power of God. We would go from sea to sea to experience the power of God. Help me out here, help me out here. There is nothing better than tasting revival. And friend, once you've had revival, once you've experienced the move of God, church as normal will not cut it. You will for the rest of your life have a void on the inside of your soul because you know what the true fire of God tastes like. You have been planted and marked and chosen by another planet. There is a God that is not of this world that has called you out of the temporary into eternity. If you don't got nothing to praise about, you ought to just praise believing that after tonight, God is going to deliver you from your religion, deliver you from drugs, deliver you from the Holy Ghost, deliver you from alcohol, deliver you from depression, deliver you from cutting, deliver you from an American dream, deliver you from apathy, complacent, comfortable, lukewarm, commercialized Christianity. God wants to break you out so that he can break in. That your box will become your coffin. It's like how long can you sit in these gatherings in your box? In your comfortable little, I don't want no one to push me out of the box and the coffin I've created. I don't want anybody sticking their finger on my flesh. I don't want anybody pointing me out. I just want to sit back and watch everybody in the front and watch the altar call, all the spectators of the kingdom, and watch the altar call and watch God move and watch the sick get healed. But I don't want to participate in the move of God. you got to get to the place where you say, I'm not going to spectate in this revival. can put out, that no devil can put out, that no preacher can put out, that no Pharisee can, when you really get the fire of almighty God, you're going to act just as wild as I do. And if you don't act radical, and you don't act crazy, you're probably not a Christian. Well, I go to church and I know the Bible, so does the devil and his demons. Well, I have picnics at my church, and I serve on the board, and so do devils serve on the board of a lot of churches. Friend, let me tell you something. If you think because the American gospel has lied to you, if you think going to church makes you a Christian, if you think reading your Bible makes you a Christian, if you know what makes you a Christian, living out the Bible. When you stand before God, God is not going to ask you if you memorize a couple verses. God is going to ask you if you've lived out the word that he spoke, the word that he inspired men to write. God is not interested 
interested in your religious jargon and your religious hoops. God is asking who is actually walking out what's on the pages. Who is actually walking this thing out. He is not interested in seeing if we know about it. He's interested in seeing if we do it. Because friend, we can preach on the book of Acts all we want and be dead on death row in our pew. You can talk about John all you want. You can talk about Lazarus all you want. But until you actually step out and begin to align your life with the word of God, it is all vanity. And there's three responses tonight to the gospel in Acts chapter 17. There's some the Bible says when Paul preached, they laugh. See, some of you tonight, this isn't serious to you. Want to know why you're not passionate? Want to know why you don't feel radical? Want to know why you're not moved when God, when the man of God gets up? Want to know why you're going to sit back in your seat during the altar call? Because this thing's just a game to you. It's like a game of Monopoly where you have fun, you act serious, and then when it's all said and done, you pack it up and it meant nothing. Some of you are sitting back like the scoffers in the book of Acts, and you're sitting there and you're going, what's a big deal? It's not that big of a deal that millions march into the depths of hell. It's not that big of a deal that my family isn't saved. It's not that big a deal that my campus goes to hell. It's not that big of a deal that the White House goes to hell. It's just a joke. Some of you young people, you're not going to be laughing on Judgment Day when you see all the stuff you could have done but didn't do. It might be a joke to you now, but when you pass into the realm of eternity, nobody's going to be laughing because we have made God and church a game. When Paul said it was a race, he wasn't saying a game and a sport. Paul was saying this thing called the gospel is everything. This thing called the gospel is the most important thing. Scoffers. And then the Bible says there were some that laughed at Paul. Second thing it says there were some that said tell us more later. This is really the biggest issue in the church. We love the word of God and we love church. We just don't want to know the whole thing. And we sit back and we spend week after week and revival after revival and service after service saying someday I'm going to give it all up. But just tell me more later. I don't want to make a decision tonight. Give me another five years to mess around in sin, to sleep with every guy and girl I can, to experiment with drugs, to experiment with alcohol, to give up my body and sell my body. And then I'll know more about your God. Because let me tell you something. Every believer and young person in the church thinks that they're going to wait until they're 30 years old to serve God. But let me tell you something. The devil wants to kill you before you turn 30. Young people are dying. Friend, you better hear me tonight. Your, la your next breath, you might be standing before Christ tonight. Every breath, every breath is a gift from God. And you look at all these young people that are overdosing, that are getting shot at, that are killing themselves, that are getting car accidents, the babies being aborted. Do you think these young people thought that they were going to die with their next breath? Do you think they thought that next week they were going to die and stand before God? Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. No, every single one of them thought that they had time. The greatest lie the devil will ever give you is that you have more time. Tonight you're going to sit back during the altar call and say maybe next week, maybe next week I'll give it to God. Maybe next week I'll go all in. Maybe next week I'll be radical. Not knowing that you might not have a next week. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. Today is a day to give it all to God. Today is a day to meet with Him. Today is a day to... Oh, Today is the day to give up your idols and your lukewarm Christianity. And then the third group believed. The third group came in the meeting and they said, this is what I've been looking for. I can see it in some of you. Some of you are already crying. You want to know why? Because this is what you've been waiting for your entire life. Because you've sat in, oh my God, you've sat in church your whole life, but this is what you were born for. When we talk about the fire of revival, when we talk about signs and wonders and miracles, something on the inside of you says, this is what I spent my life looking for. I've been looking from church to church for the fire of God, and now I found it. I got something in me. I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of wait. I want to believe in what you're preaching. So what group do you fall into? The group that laughs about it? Some of you on the awakening team, it's a joke now to you. 
God's not a big deal anymore. It's not as serious as your soap opera and your reality TV show that's going to bring you to hell quicker than crack. You think this is some kind of game when America hangs in the balance. When we are God's plan A, he has no plan B. We are God's only option for revival. His only choice for revival in America. God is not have God doesn't have a secret plan if we don't get this thing right. We either get this thing right or the judgment of God comes upon our nation. The judgment of God comes upon our campuses. So make a choice tonight. Don't sit back and say maybe next week. Don't sit back like it's not that big of a deal and stare at me. You better believe this thing and say God let it be unto me. Here I am. Choose me. I'll go to the nations. I'll preach this gospel. I am available to be used by you. Can I be honest? I don't think God can find someone in the American church to use if he wanted to. I think if God pulled up the millions of believers in America on a Google search and searched in believer that will go to the nations and work for me, I think it would come up as zero search results found because I think God looks at the church and says, I'm not looking for people that go through the motions. I'm not looking for people that are self-righteous. I am looking for people that would surrender everything to this call, that would lay down their lives, that would be willing to lose their heads. And the Bible says that God searches the earth for somebody whose heart is turned towards him, somebody that wants his fire. What do you mean, Isaiah? Millions of believers, and you're saying, out of all the people in this room, God can't find someone to use. No, I'm saying the Bible says that. In Ezekiel chapter 2, Israel is in a place where the leadership of Israel was telling people that what was unholy was holy, what was bad was actually good, and what was good was actually bad. Ezekiel 22 is describing the state of America. Preachers that get up here and say the things that God says not to do, you can do. The things that God says are unholy are now holy. We think as preachers, we can change the word of God. And so God came to Ezekiel and says, Ezekiel, I've been noticing all the corruption in the church. I've been noticing all the false grace and the false preaching. And he says this. This is the next verse. He says, and I looked for a man to stand in the gap to build the wall of righteousness. And he said, but I found none. What do you mean? Thousands of priests, the Levitical order, people going in and out of the temple, and God says, but I can't find one person that would rebuild the gap of righteousness. And God says, I want to find a man so I wouldn't have to judge the nation. He says, but because there's nobody in the church that I can find or use that will be sold out for this gospel, 100% all in. He says, then I have to pour down my wrath and fire upon the nation. Well, brother, I, I, already, I already could hear your thoughts. Well, brother, you're preaching the Old Testament, not the New Testament. No, Jesus told the disciples, if you go and preach and they don't accept your preaching, they're going to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. If you think God is a little rainbow pansy because we're in the New Testament, you have not read your Bible. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And the God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. Jesus didn't get saved in the New Testament and got really, really nice. Jesus became the penalty for sin to hold back the judgment and wrath of God that we deserved. But as the church rejects God denies the son of God, denies being sold out and radical. God is therefore by legal right able to pour out his wrath because if you keep reading John 3 16 it says the wrath of God is revealed to those who reject God that if you don't accept the son of God you are already condemned you don't have to have somebody condemn you if you don't listen to me friend look at me if you don't accept the government and lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ in your life you don't need a preacher yelling at you pointing his finger at you because you've judged yourself and you've condemned yourself by rejecting the risen son of God and America rejects the son of God to have programs because we don't want persecution we have programs and our pulpits are filled with puppets instead of prophets we got a bunch of guys that are afraid to preach the word of God that are afraid to go into their prayer closet and get a fresh fire a fresh word fresh manna so we get up here and we recycle what we heard some other preachers say and the American church lives on death row 
The pews of America are filled with skeletons, and then we wonder why we can't reach the lost. Why 4% of young people even attend church. Why aren't we losing, friend, we are losing, listen, we are losing our generation, and you're still sitting here, and it's not that big of a deal, and when are you going to give me a fancy revelation, and I don't really like the way you're preaching, like, tell me something, tell me what Simon Peter's name means, tell me what the Hebrew and Greek word, what does it matter, friend, if I'm here tonight, breaking down Hebrew and Greek, and giving you the latest and greatest revelation that God gave me, if the nation and the city goes to hell, what does it matter on judgment day, when preachers stand before God, and God says, you broke down the Hebrew and Greek, but you didn't know me. What does it matter if you stand before God and God says you pray in red, but I don't know who you were praying to and I don't know what you were reading about? What does it matter if on judgment day we find out that we were going through the motions? What does it matter that when we stand before God, God says, I don't know what got into you. I don't know who possessed you, but the, the thing you were preaching and the thing you were going to, I wasn't supporting your walk. We have a God that doesn't judge people anymore, that doesn't have a judgment seat, that when you stand before God, he's going to let you waltz right in with no responsibility, no repentance, and all of our sin and carnality, going through the motions, living for our 401k, living for the American dream, and living for ourselves, and you think God is just going to look it over after sending his only son to die for our sin so that we wouldn't have to live like the rest of America. We are slapping God in the face by living according to status quo. We are going to stand before God, and God is going to say, you wasted my blood because you didn't break out of normal. Friend, let me tell you about the book of Acts. The church in the book of Acts was so passionate, was so radical, was so vibrant, that they went and turned the cities upside down. They weren't gathering for parties and picnics and programs. They were gathering for the fire of Almighty God. They were laying hands on the sick. They were raising the dead. Their shadows were falling. And the Bible says that Peter and John came to the temple called beautiful. They came to the gate of the church where a crippled man laid there. People are outside of our church, crippled by religion, crippled by anxiety, crippled by depression, and you know what we're doing? We're walking right into church, right past the people, laying right out in front. And Peter and John come, full of the Holy Ghost, and the guy was, the Bible says, he was born crippled, which understand something. What it was giving you a picture was, we are all born crippled by sin, unable to walk out the service of God without being healed. See, every single one of us were born unrighteous. Every single one of us were born crippled by the power of sin. So every one of us needs somebody to come to us and tell us to get up out of our sin, get up out of our dysfunction, get up. You're the vehicle to tell the crippled nation. But we do what the Good Samaritan story did where he was on the road to Jericho. You know what the religious people do? They see the crippled, they see the beat, they see the lame, and they walk right past it to go to their gathering. They walk right past the sick person at Starbucks because they got to get on a plane. I'm talking to myself here. They got to get on a plane to go preach to a bunch of whitewashed Christians. They walk right past the very people that God is sending us to save. We're watching them beat down on the road to Jericho. And instead of stopping and cleaning them up and paying for them to stay somewhere, we walk right past them. Because, friend, you better hear me. Religion will always walk past the very people that Christ came to save. Religion will always be worried about the gathering, but not about the people gathering out in the city that are lost going to hell when's the last time you stopped for somebody that was in need on the side of the road oh let me get too spiritual for you here when's the last time you gave a homeless man five dollars when's the last time you laid hands on that person outside of 7-eleven and saying i might not have money i might not have a house i might not have a big church but what i do have i give you see the man was laying at the gate crippled and he asked peter and john for some money see some of you came tonight for one thing but you're going to get another thing. See, you might have came because a friend brought you. You might have came because you saw an invite on Facebook. You might have came because you saw an invite on Twitter, and you said, I just came to check it out. I just came to see what was happening, but you're about to get something that you weren't even asking for because the Bible says that the crippled man asked for money, and Peter and John said, we don't have money, but you can have what we have because I'm telling you, the world is outside begging for drugs, begging for alcohol, 
Paul, begging to be depressed, begging for suicide. They're asking for things that they think they need to continue to live. And they're looking for something that's better than drugs, better than alcohol, better than cutting. And that's the power. Help me out here. That is the power of Almighty God. And it doesn't... See... It's a cop-out to say, I can't help the world because I don't have a church and I don't have money. Because everywhere I travel, I see people saying, I don't have what it takes. I don't have a church. I don't have money. I don't have finances. But you do have something in you that is ten times worth more, that is ten times better. Lay down the excuses. But you got the power of God in you. You have the ability to go up to the lost, to go up to the sick, and to grab them by the hand. And the Bible says that the guy jumped up and started dancing. Do you want to know why we stand up in church? Do you want to know why we praise in church? Because we all in this room used to be crippled. And then a man came by the name of Jesus and picked us up out of our sin, picked us up out of our depression. And the Bible says when God heals you, you begin to leap. You're, listen, you not standing, leaping, shouting is a sign you're still crippled. Friend, you better hear me. Your lack of enthusiasm and passion, well, we don't have to shout. Actually, the Bible says to shout. It's a biblical command to lift up your hands. So if you don't feel like lifting your hands, guess what? It doesn't matter because it's a biblical command. I don't always feel like preaching and waking up early, but I do it because Christ tells me to do it. So you better just get over yourself and learn how to lift your hands, learn how to praise, learn how to shout, learn how to get excited. You make yourself get excited. If you don't want to get excited, you you make those hands. The Bible says that the man was crippled. Peter and John gave him what they had. Watch this. This is so key right here. The Bible says he got up and he went into the temple with them. You want to know why people don't come to church? Because we're not healing them on the outside. We're trying to heal them on the inside. The guy didn't get healed inside the temple in the gathering. The guy got healed outside the gathering, and because he met God on the outside, he wanted to meet God on the inside. See, the true church of Jesus Christ didn't get people to fill out cards and get saved at some stupid play where no one even preached the gospel, and then some pastor gets up and says, who wants to receive Jesus? Just come up here and pray a five-minute prayer. After the blood of Jesus wasn't talked about, repentance wasn't talked about, the cross wasn't talked about, but come up and get saved after watching a Cinderella a play everything will be fine no in the bible can i tell you what they did they brought the church outside the building they brought the church to the people and when the people encountered god outside of the church they said now we want to go inside the temple and find out what this is all about you want to know how to grow a church? You don't need to build a coffee shop. You don't need to shop at H&M. You don't need to wear leather boots and tight pants. You got to get a prayer life. You got to begin to heal the sick. You got to begin to raise the dead. You got to begin to prophesy. The world, the world wants to see that we have the power. But you know what the problem is now? Instead of the, wor the, ch the world being crippled at the gate of the church, the church is crippled at the gates of the world. We sit at the gates of the systems and the kingdoms of this world, and instead of the church asking us for we, what we have, we ask the world what they have. What can you guys give us? All, you, listen, friend, the way they dress is the way every youth pastor dresses. The slang things they say are the things the church say. We are so unoriginal and so uninspired by God that we have to follow after everything little Wayne does. We have to follow. That's why you won't hear me talking about swag. I can care less about dumb swag. I want the kingdom of God. We have to stop stealing the things from this world and trying to conform them to the kingdom. Stop trying to be cool in the eyes of the world and start being obedient in the eyes of God. God is more concerned with you being original. In the church of Acts, because they stood up against the culture and against status quo, they actually got persecuted. Church in America doesn't get persecuted because we're not standing up for a lick. 
We're not, we're sta- you know, we're standing up for the American dream. We're standing up for love and grace and humanism. And let me tell you something, friend. Love and grace and all that good stuff that's in the Bible that's been manipulated and made hyper, that does not offend the cultures of this world. It doesn't challenge people's lifestyle. It doesn't challenge people's sin. It says live how you want because Jesus loves you either way, so there's no reason in changing. Jesus does love you either way, but friend, you know the scary part about the unconditional love of God? He can love you and then throw you into hell after and because God's love is unconditional you can be burning in the pit of hell and God still love you you'll be you'll be in hell for all of eternity for billions and billions of years and it'll feel like eternity just started and you'll be cursing every preacher that didn't preach to you the truth you'll be shaking this is what your bible says you'll be shaking your fist at every grace false malnutrition anemic preacher and you'll say why didn't somebody tell me the truth why didn't someone in acts chapter 8 the bible says that Saul was going about persecuting the church the bible says that he held the garments of the ones that murdered Stephen see a lot of you in this room you say I I'm not murdering other believers. I'm not murdering other Christians. I'm not doing anything bad. But all the gossip that we do in the church, all the fighting each other, because if you want to see where the church is really at, go on Facebook because you'll find out we're not fighting the devil. We're fighting each other. See, you might not be the one gossiping about your pastor, but you might be holding the robes to the person that's gossiping about your pastor. See, you might not be the one doing all the little idle drama you're doing in the church and your little click that you're trying to make, your subdivision. You might not be the actual one initiating it, but by being in that group, you are liable for the assassination that they're doing to people's character, for the assassination, for the persecution that we're bringing upon each other. We are not fighting the devil. And I think the devil sits back and laughs in Maui and says, look at the way they fight each other. Look at the way they talk about each other on Facebook. Look at the way, look at, look at 50 came to their prayer meeting and 15 came to the prayer meeting. Look at the way they're fighting over their prayer meetings. Look at the way they're fighting over the, what that church is doing. And well, I don't even have to send devils over there. The devil could just go on vacation because we got enough problems in the church fighting our brothers that don't believe like us. Fighting our brothers that don't speak in tongues. Fighting our brothers that do speak in tongues. Fighting the church next door because revival happened at their church and didn't happen at my church. You want to know why revival isn't going to happen in America? Because if it broke out in one church we are so selfish and jealous no one would even come you know who comes to the revival the drug addicts the prostitutes the homeless people religious people don't want to be a part of the move of God the Bible says that Paul Saul was going house to house yanking believers out of their house a day where you're in your house at three in the morning Oh, because there will come a day, friend, whether you think I'm nuts or not, I know this is going to happen. And you hear a knock on the door at 3 a.m., and your kids are asleep, and you open up the door, and four men barge into your house. And the last time you see your little babies is when they're pulling them out of your house, and you hear your kids screaming. And you wake up in a dungeon cell in America because you preached the gospel, and because you had a prayer life, and because you knew God. Friend, if you don't think that there's going to come a day where they pull us out of our houses, where they persecute us for this gospel, where we got to lose our head for this thing, where we got to get hung for this thing, you are sadly mistaken because if it happened to the Bible it's going to happen today and the bottom line is America is the minority not the majority do you know that the unpersecuted church is the minority of the church of Christ in the world the major percentages what does this have to do with me tell me how blessed God wants me to be these are our brothers and sisters getting skinned alive while we sit in here and don't get moved by the gospel don't get excited about God don't have prayer gatherings don't have prayer meetings the very things they're dying for we take for granted we are selfish in the American church because they're getting skinned for it and we wouldn't give a piece of skin for it we wouldn't give up, we don't even give up five dollars in the offering, yet we think that one day we're going to get martyred for the gospel. You don't give fifteen dollars for tithe once a month, and you think that when persecution comes you're going to last? When you don't even show up to a prayer meeting, you think that when the nation comes together and comes against us, you're still going to be here? Friend, if you can't read your Bible every day, do you honestly think you're going to get your head taken off for the gospel? If you don't wake up and pray in the morning, you really think that when the nation get, you better get ready for this stuff, because there's going to come a day where you can't call the police, because the police are the very ones after you. The Bible says that Paul was persecuting, and the persecution of the church caused them to scatter. 
In other words, when the enemy meant to put out the flame, he was only spreading the flame. See, here's what persecution does. When persecution comes up against you, it brings you out of your comfort zone. It takes you out of your religious bubble, and it takes you out into the streets because you get persecuted by the church. People say, you're too radical. We don't want you here. So you say, okay, I'll go find someone that does want it. See, I stand here today, and I thank God for some of the people that came against us. I thank God for some of the people that backbite us and backstab us. I thank God for some of the people God didn't let us connect with. Because if it had not been for the Saul's, if it had not been for the Pharisees, if it had not been for the persecutors, we wouldn't even be in this building. But God has to raise up people that will break you out of your comfort zone. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. God has to raise up people that will break you out of your bubble, break you out of your comfort zone. Let some trials. So God allowed it. And the Bible says as they were scattered, they preached everywhere. Let me say this again, because God convicted me today of this. They preached everywhere. Do you preach everywhere? They preach when it wasn't convenient. We only preach when it was convenient. They preach when they didn't feel like it. We only preach when we feel like it. They preach while they were getting persecuted. We only preach when we're getting praised. See, the church in the New Testament, they preach everywhere they went. So you're telling me, Isaiah, they didn't just preach at school and just preach at work in their area of influence? You're telling me that everyone they came across, they shared the gospel with? No, I'm not. I'm telling you the Bible says that everywhere they went, they preached the gospel. We have to get to this place where everywhere we go, they know the light is on the inside of us. That everywhere they go, they know we have the gospel. They preached everywhere they went. And the Bible says Philip went into Samaria. Now remember I preached you that Samaria was a city that Jesus already visited. They, the scholars say that Philip actually went into Sychar. Sychar in the Hebrew means to be intoxicated by strong drink. See the problem in the church why God will not send us into regions that are intoxicated because we are already intoxicated. You cannot go into a city and preach to alcoholics when you drink wine at your house. You cannot go into a city and set people free when you drink beer at the bar. There is no way to go into Sychar and set them free. But understand this, even though Jesus already preached to Samaria, Philip preached a second time. Because there are some people in your life that aren't ready to hear the gospel the first time you present it. So they have to have you present it a second time. See, a lot of us preach, I'm guilty of this, and we'll tell someone about God, and they say, I'm just not interested. I don't really want to know about your God. But you just got to wait a couple months of prayer, a couple months of believing God. You go back to that same person, and they're going to want to hear it. But you got to be ready Nino preach. Is Nep here? Where are you at, Nep? Are you in here? I know you're in here somewhere. Okay, you're not here. You said you're going to be here. Maybe you're here. Nino preached to Nep. How many years, Nino? Eight years? Seven years. Seven years returning to Samaria, saying, I'm going to preach again. Even though God already did it once, I'm going to do it again. Some of you need to go home tonight, and you need to preach again. You need to call that friend that rejected you, that persecuted you, that came against you, and say, I'm going to tell him about God one more time. I'm going to preach this gospel one more time. I'm going to share my faith one more time, because this time they might want it. Now, the Bible says, Philip went into Samaria, and there was a man named Simon. Simon was a sorcerer. The Bible says that the city was astounded that the, the rich and the poor, the influential and the uninfluential were astounded by Simon for many years. Now Simon represent a type of counterfeit religion, a witchcraft Christianity. Simon will get you under his little religious spell. He'll get you to come to church but never meet God. He'll get you involved in his little love and grace, his little circle of friends. And Simon was preaching to the city. And now this is what's interesting. It says that many were calling him the power of God, not lowercase God, actual God, which means the people were deceived into thinking he was a vessel sent and chosen by God when he was really just a deceiver that was practicing magic on the congregation and on the people. So the people were astounded by his religious magic. You might not be able to get up here and say, Isaiah, I was addicted to drugs and God set me free. You might not be able to get up here and say, Isaiah, I was addicted to alcohol and God set me free. You might not be able to get up here and say, Isaiah, I was a homosexual and God set me free. But a lot of you have the same exact story. You can get up here and say, I was in church 15 
15 years and never met God. I was in church 10 years. I was addicted to religion. Why? Because you were under the spell of the Simon believers, the Simon pastors that will convince you that what they're doing is of God, that will convince you that church is going fine, that everything's okay without God showing up. But it's a type of, watch this, it's a type of counterfeit gospel, and Simon is a picture of a counterfeit Christian. Now, the Bible says this, that when Philip showed up, the people turned away from Simon, and they began to follow Philip, because lukewarm, fake Christianity could only last so long. When the true remnant shows up, when true authentic revival, help me out here, when true authentic revival and Christianity show up, people know the real thing. The church is full of counterfeit Christians, and you can't tell they're counterfeit until you examine their private life. See, you can't tell money's counterfeit until you get the real thing and compare it to the counterfeit. And the counterfeits always get upset when you expose the fact that they were living in church fake this entire time. So now Philip shows up, and the Bible says that everyone was getting baptized, and Philip came. The Bible says that Philip preached Christ. One of the issues why we're not having revival, we don't preach Christ. We preach about our church. We preach about our program. We preach about our play. We preach about our religion. But we're not preaching the dissension, the ascension, the resurrection, the redemption. We're not preaching the blood, the 39 lives and the cross. We are preaching a man-made gospel that doesn't bring dead men to life. It brings living men dead. But when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you preach the cross, see every single one of you that are saved in this room, you came in here and you heard about the blood of Jesus. You heard about the cross and something came alive in you when you heard about the cross. Nobody preached a program. Nobody did a little play. You heard about the cross of Christ and it compelled you to change. Not only did he preach the cross, he did miracles. He did signs and wonders. He cast out devils. You know the basic requirements of being a believer in the New Testament? And, and you understand, Philip wasn't even a pastor. Philip was a deacon. He wasn't even a mega superstar. You know what's sad? If we do the normal things they did in the book of Acts in the church of today, we'll get put up on a pedestal and become a Christian celebrity. But in the Bible, the things that they were doing were the basic things of God. See, the book of Acts, watch this. The book of Acts isn't a means of attaining. It's not an end point. It's the beginning of the journey of the church of Jesus Christ. We are sitting here saying, how can we get to the book of Acts? How could we see shadows fall? When that wasn't the end for them, that was the beginning for them. See, the shadows falling wasn't the advanced things of God. It was the basic things of God. The dead getting raised wasn't something they were trying to achieve or acquire. The dead getting raised came with being the church of Jesus Christ. So the Bible says that Simon is there, Philip is there, and then it says this, that Simon followed Philip and was baptized. You know the problem with a lot of us? We're following Philip, not following Christ. Simon didn't follow Christ, he followed Philip. Some of you in this room, you're not following God, you're following a family member. You're following a cousin that goes to church. And you know why you're only going to last five months saved? is because you're following somebody. You're not following someone. You're not following the cross. You're following the crowd. See, when you follow Philip, when Philip messes up, you mess up. When Philip prays, you pray. The Bible says the children of Israel were dependent upon Moses. So every time Moses went to travel, went on vacation. See, every time we leave to go speak and travel, I find out in the ministry who was following Christ and who was following me and Nino. See, because every time we leave, two or three people fall flat on their face because they were not looking unto Christ, the author and finisher of their faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. They were looking unto Isaiah Saldivar and unto Nino and unto the miracles. See, Simon got excited because miracles were happening in the revival, because people were getting saved in the revival, because Philip was preaching the gospel. So Simon said, I want to join this thing, but understand, Simon was a counterfeit conversion. Even though he's the Bible says he believed in Christ and he got baptized. The Bible says that when Peter and John came, now Peter and John came to the revival to see if the people getting saved were really saved. And we have to stop being afraid as young people and as preachers of the gospel to have older men come in our lives and check on our ministries. All right, I'm going to skip that because y'all are too, you're not ready for that. Peter and John came to see, watch this, came to see 
if the salvations that were happening in the church were actually authentic salvations and if the Samaritans were actually getting converted or they were just pretending. What would happen if Jesus walked into our churches and said, show me all the salvation cards you filled out for the entire year. Friend, do you know that one day I believe that pastors will stand on the judgment seat of Christ and God's going to get thousands of cards of I, I gave my life to Jesus and God's going to get 10,000 upon 10,000 cards and God's going to say, do you know where these people are? Did you disciple these people? Did you tell these people about the cross? Did you tell these people about the price? God is going to make, listen friend, every single person that walks through those doors, we are accountable for and we are responsible for. And Peter and John came to see if the uh, salvation was authentic. The Bible says when they got there, the first thing they did was lay hands on the believers and they received the Holy Spirit. If you are in this room tonight and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Holy Ghost, it is impossible. The first thing we are supposed to do, for all you that want more teaching, the first thing we are supposed to do when somebody gets saved is not get them to fill out a card, it's to lay hands on them so they can get the Holy Ghost. It blows my mind how thousands of believers sit in church their whole lives but never get the... How did you go to church for 15 years and never get the Holy Ghost? 10 years. There's, I could point out someone in this room that's been in church 30 years and never got the Holy Ghost and never heard of the Holy Ghost till they came here. And you know what, friend? It's a tragedy that people have to wait 30 years dying in church before they actually encounter God. The Holy Ghost is available tonight for every single believer. If you're in this place and you need the power of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is here. They laid hands. And then Simon said, how much does it cost to buy that power? Because Simon wanted ministry without relationship. See, Simon wasn't interested in following God. Simon was interested in following the revival and being a counterfeit Christian and, let, and not letting anybody know that really his heart wasn't right with God. See, Simon was in the revival. Simon came to the gatherings, but Simon had a heart issue. Simon didn't really love God like everybody thought he loved God. Simon knew how to put on a little show because back in his old life, Simon was a performer like many of you. See, a lot of you in your past, you, you knew how to put on a show. You, need to put, you knew how to put on a mask. And just like Simon, you came into the kingdom and because your old life still has a grip on you, you know how to fake it. Tonight you come in here and everybody thinks you're on fire. And everybody thinks you have a prayer life. And everybody thinks you have it all together. But you might be able to fool Philip. And you might be able to fool Peter and John. But you can't fool Yahweh. See, when God sees down on you, he sees your heart. And all of a sudden, Peter turns around. Can we get the music on, Ashley? We're going to end it here in a second. All of a sudden, Peter turns around. I know it's hot in here, and you got some of you guys who have been standing and waiting, so we're not gonna, I'm not going to go into depth on all this stuff. I was going to go into depth. With, I feel the Holy Ghost is ready to do it right now. The Bible says that Peter looked at him and says this to him. This is what he said. Now, remember, Simon's a believer following the revival, part of the crew, part of the club, been baptized and believes. Peter said, let your money be destroyed with your thinking. He says this, that God, God's gift cannot be bought. He said, this one he says, he says, your heart isn't right with God. You're full of bitter jealousy and you're captive by sin. A man who, wait a minute, hold on Peter, you obviously haven't read any good Christian books lately about sozo and about deliverance and about when we get saved, um, we're always saved and there's no such thing as being captain of sin once we're saved and God just says, you, you, you obviously haven't read these brand new books that are just coming out, these new doctrines are finding, no, Peter said you might be here tonight and you might be part of the revival and you might be following what God's doing but it doesn't mean that your heart's right, it doesn't mean you've given up jealousy and he said, and you know what Simon, even though you're following the revival and a part of it, you're not going to last very long because because you're still captive by sin. You haven't let go of those things even though you've been at the revival. There are areas in your life that have captivated you, that have gripped you, that have viced you. And he said, Simon, you've been playing the part. You've been going through the motions this entire time. Everybody thought that you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ. But you haven't even lasted a chapter, Simon. And now you're going very back to the world. And he said, Simon, I, 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 I hope the judgment God. And then Simon does this. You have two choices when someone rebukes you. You can either, can we get the lights down. We're going to go into an altar call right here. Everyone in this room, stand to your feet. You have two choices tonight when somebody comes and brings you a rebuking word and comes against your own theology and your own gospel, whatever you're doing. Here's what Simon said. Simon was going through the motions. John, Peter, rebuke him. The disciples tell him he wasn't in it for the right reasons. You can hit that music, Ashley. And Simon does this. He says, pray for me that what you said might happen to me doesn't happen to me. Simon heard the message. Friend, the message Peter gave Simon 
It doesn't sound like much love on that right there. You know what it was? It was love because Peter was trying to save his soul. Do you know what Peter was doing? Peter was saying, Simon, I don't want you to go through the motions. But Ashley, help me with this mic. He was saying, I don't want you to go through the motions and then find out on judgment day you never really knew God. I just want to tell you tonight that if your heart isn't right, that if you have jealousy in your heart, if you have bitterness in your heart, that you cannot follow Christ the way Christ wants you to follow him. I'm telling you tonight, you got to let go of any jealousy of other people, any jealousy of preachers, any jealousy of ministry. Listen, friend, the power of God cannot be bought. It comes with having a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. The signs and wonders and miracles come out of covenant with our Savior. And Peter said, if you don't get your heart right, if you don't get out of jealousy, if you don't let Christ set you free from the captivity of sin, he said, you can have no part in what God's doing. And then Simon said, brother, would you pray for me? Why'd you come tonight? You came tonight so we can pray with you. We came to fight for your for, against your cancer. We came to fight against your depression. We came to fight against your sin. We